Hello, I'm Monica Bobra. I'm a research scientist at Stanford University, and I study the sun. I'm here today on behalf of the SunPy community to talk about the status of the SunPy project, and now version 2.0 of the core package. We just released version 2.0. So this talk will cover three sections. Why do we need SunPy? What's in SunPy version 2.0? And this section will also cover what we added for 1.0. And finally, how did we hopefully gain visibility in the solar physics community? This section is more of a generally applicable lessons learned about how to gain visibility within any community, particularly an academic one. So first, why do we need SunPy? What is solar physics all about? The sun is an active star. It constantly spews particles into space at speeds of about 500 kilometers per second, which we call the solar wind. And the solar wind interacts with all of the planets. We'll see Venus here shortly. It interacts with the Earth's atmosphere to produce the aurora, and it carves out a magnetic bubble that the solar system lives in called the heliosphere. So studying the sun helps us understand all these different interconnected behaviors throughout the solar system. So let's take a look at the sun. These images were taken by a NASA satellite called the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And one pixel here is about the size of the San Francisco Bay Area. These are UV images, so they're in false color and they're capturing plasma at temperatures of about a million degrees. And these are the kind of data that solar physicists work with. We work with image data, spectral data, time series data, and in-situ data. Some examples of satellites that take in-situ measurements include NASA's Parker Solar Probe, which in January of this year became the closest man-made object to the sun. Solar Probe measured particles and magnetic fields directly from the sun's outer atmosphere. Another example is from the European Space Agency's Solar Orbiter satellite, which flew through the tails of a comet named Atlas last month. This is a Hubble image of Atlas from this April. In the United States alone, the NASA Heliophysics Division operates 19 space-based missions, six of which study the sun. And the National Science Foundation operates 10 ground-based facilities that study the sun. To take advantage of all of these observatories, the solar physics community often conducts coordinated campaigns where many instruments observe the same target for the same time period. And this gives us a ton of data, image data, spectral data, time series data, in situ data, and data spanning the entire electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays. And all these data have different fields of view and different cadences and different observer locations. And the real power of SunPy is to provide general purpose tools to analyze all these disparate data together. And in the next section, I'll highlight three elements of our core package that do just that. So what's in SunPy version 2.0? In this section, I'll include what we added for both 1.0 and 2.0 because it took us eight years from 2011 to 2019 to cross the 1.0 milestone and only a few months to go from there to 2.0. I'll talk about three major components of the SunPy core package, the data retriever, FIDO, data containers such as MAP, and a framework for coordinate systems. The SunPy data retriever, FIDO, provides a unified API for querying and downloading data from all these different space-based and ground-based observatories. So now, if you're looking for data on a particular date, or if you're looking for data that matches a particular target or wavelength, you can query 90-something percent of all the solar data that's out there and download whatever matches your search criteria. And here is an example. Here I am using FIDO to search and retrieve magnetic field data on a particular date. In version 1.0, we improved FIDO to download data in parallel using the PAR5 package. And in 2.0, FIDO now uses tab completion for any attribute you might want to search against. 
Data containers are another big component of SumPy Core. We currently have two, time series and map. These two containers provide a general, standard, and consistent interface for analyzing time series and image data from different observatories. So for example, let's take a closer look at SumPy map. So suppose I use FIDO to download images taken at the same time, but by different instruments in different wavelengths and with different observer locations. This image shows the solar atmosphere in UV light taken by the Solar Dynamics Observatory satellite, which is in an inclined geosynchronous orbit. And this image from the same time shows the solar surface in optical light taken by the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, which orbits the L1 Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun. The map object will co-align all these images and put them in a common coordinate system used to specify positions on the Sun. So now all these image data are in a map object and I can perform whatever operations I want. In version 2.0, we updated map with a few more methods to quickly analyze image data, like plotting a histogram of all the pixel values. And for version 3.0, we plan to upgrade from a two-dimensional coordinate aware data container to an n-dimensional one using a SunPy affiliated package called ndcube. So with ndcube, you could have, for example, a map object that contains three-dimensional data, latitude, longitude, and time. And then you could extract a subset of that data using a range of latitudes and longitudes. Also for 3.0, we plan to include another container for spectral data. And the last thing I want to highlight in this section are coordinates. There are many different coordinate systems for specifying positions on or near the sun. And SunPy provides a way to transform data between all these coordinate systems. We can also, thanks to the AstroPy coordinates framework, transform between solar and celestial coordinates. Here's an example. This is an image of the solar atmosphere taken by a NASA satellite called Stereo. Stereo has an instrument on it that blocks out the solar disk so you can see the solar atmosphere, which is about a million times dimmer in optical light. As a byproduct, you can also see some stars. But which stars are these? Well, we can query a catalog of stars observed by the Gaia satellite, transform the position of these stars to the helioprojective Cartesian coordinates we see here, and plot them on the image. So in some ways, SumPy coordinates does more than just coordinate transformations. It also enables interdisciplinary science. For SumPy version 1.0, we did a lot of tests to improve the precision of our coordinate transformations. We also improved the tooling that gets the position of all the planets, asteroids, comets, and spacecraft in our solar system. And for 2.0, we also improved our treatment of differential rotation or the change in rotation rate as a function of latitude. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of what SumPy is about and how we've improved the core package. This doesn't include everything that went into the 1.0 and 2.0 releases. For example, 1.0 also included a huge cleanup. We removed about 3,000 lines of code, but hopefully it gives you some flavor of what we've been working on. Okay, so my last section is, how did we hopefully gain visibility in the solar physics community? So in the last year, we've made progress in four categories. We surveyed the solar physics community, we published papers and accumulated citations, and we won some funding. And these three accomplishments really get the attention of the academic community. And I know a lot of people in the scientific Python community have talked extensively about using these as a way to hack prestige. And this concept has worked really well for us in the SunPy project. So I'll go through each of these four categories and talk about what we did and how it helped us gain visibility. Last year, we surveyed members of the solar physics community about the software and hardware tools they're currently using. And this year, 
we published the results of our survey in the peer-reviewed journal Solar Physics with open access. And here are a couple of results. This plot shows software tools on the y-axis, percentage of users on the x-axis, and the colors represent career stage. This result helped us gain visibility by showing quantitatively and unambiguously that scientific Python is particularly popular among students and postdocs, and most importantly, valuable to everyone. And this may seem like an obvious result, but every scientific subdiscipline has its own culture, and some are less likely to use modern software tools than others. So unambiguously showing high adoption rates for Python is an important step toward redefining the culture of a particular scientific discipline. Here's another plot. This shows computational resource on the y-axis, the percentage of users on the x-axis, and here the colors represent solar physics research area. And you can see that only a small fraction of respondents use a cluster or the cloud for their research, even though the community is building observatories and numerical models that generate a ton of data. And this presents an opportunity for us to gain visibility. We can show, for example, how to use SumPy together with tools for parallel and distributed computing like Dask to create a single language workflow that can take advantage of computing power. So on to the second category, papers. This year we published an open access paper in the Astrophysical Journal to coincide with our version 1.0 release. And we also wrote a companion paper in the Journal of Open Source Software, or JOS, which is open access by default. This gave us visibility for a lot of reasons. First, two peer-reviewed journals formally recognized us for having scientific merit. Second, it gave us the opportunity to tell the community what we're trying to do, which we hadn't fully written down before. And this was also a valuable internal exercise in clarifying those ideas to ourselves. And finally, these papers give people something to cite, which brings me to my third point. Citations. They give you visibility by default. No academic community will ignore a highly cited paper. But the question is, will people cite scientific software? So here's another result from our community survey. We asked people, have you cited software papers in your published research? And you can see only 40% said yes, and about 30% said no. But we found in a follow-up question that most people who don't cite scientific software simply don't know how. They're not opposed to it, they just don't know how. So it's important to be extremely clear about how to cite scientific software. Okay, so here's my last point. Funding. This year, we won a NASA grant to support the development of the SunPy code base, which was really exciting. This was our timeline. In June 2018, we applied through NumFocus to a NASA solicitation that requested proposals to advance the goal of a robust, vital, and cohesive Python environment in heliophysics. They wanted to give out about 500K in grants to roughly a dozen projects. In October 2019, we found out we won. And three SunPy affiliated packages won as well. And this gave us visibility because we proved we were valuable to NASA. Finally, in April of this year, we decided to spend the money by hiring a developer. But maybe an even bigger deal than winning the solicitation is that NASA opened it in the first place. Because we could never win any money if we didn't have the opportunity to apply for it. But the good news is that I think any open source project can create opportunities for funding by taking two steps. One, talk to people at funding agencies. And two, show them examples of awesome new research that relies on open source scientific software. It's not easy, but it can work. We in the SunPy community spent so much time at conferences and workshops and meetings, talking to people in the NASA Heliophysics Division, and it really paid off. 
So making progress in all of these four areas can help a project gain visibility, but also ultimately redefine science policy. There are already some examples of policy recommendations that support open source scientific software, such as this excellent report on reproducibility and replicability in science from the US National Academy of Science. But members of the solar physics community and some other academic communities pay more attention to what's known as decadal surveys. These surveys define the scientific priorities for any given field over the next 10 years. And we're really happy to see support for open source scientific software in the solar and space physics mid-decadal survey, which came out in February of this year. So that's it. And I'd like to conclude by saying, if you wanna get involved, please get in touch. The Python and heliophysics community just got started a couple years ago and currently has 59 packages for people who study everything from the Earth's upper atmosphere to the edge of the solar system. So it's a great place to make a big impact. And SunPy is super excited to have new contributors and everyone is really nice, which is what drew me to the SunPy community in the first place. So if you have any interest, check out our website and come chat with us and hopefully we can have some fun and write some code.